What is up, everybody? It's Dr. Vibe here, host and producer of the award-winning Dr. Vibe show, the home of Epic Conversations, and I'm the host of Epic Conversations. As always, I like to say you're blessed, highly favored, a magnet for miracles, and a solution for someone's problem, and I am so jacked because Black Lady Magic is back. Now, if you don't know what that is, your wood is wet, but you can get dried off after this conversation. Most of the time, we have, well, we used to have, it was a three-country conversation. Now, it's only a yeah. two-country conversation because uh, Ms. Leah is back in the USA. Don't know for yes. how long, but she is back there now. But uh, yeah. to my right, I have Dr. Tachi. Welcome, Dr. Tachi. Do share about yourself. Hi, Hi. I'm Dr. Tachi. I don't know what else you like. <laughs> well, okay, so yeah. Well, she she and she's so humble. She is a host of the livest. Oh yeah. Thank you. Can, can you complete that now? Yes, <laughs> I am the host of Media Scope with the, one of the livest audiences on live stream. I talk all about media tech and pop culture news every Wednesday <laughs> on Par. Oh, bless you, Periscope and Facebook Live and Twitter, as well as the pre-show on um, Instagram Live, and I'm also a journalist, a filmmaker, and a media content producer. Absolutely. Uh, you Okay, we'll get to Ms. Leah. Ms. Leah, back in the, well, I'm not Bruce Springsteen, back in the USA, or born in the USA, born <laughs> in the USA and back in the USA. What Both it, are accurate. Exactly. Leah, do you share a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um... By day, I'm a diplomat representing the United States overseas embassies, but in all other ways, I'm a freelancer, award-winning blogger, children's book author, speaker, and social media influencer, among other things. Um, and I'm looking to continue to share my points of view and thoughts and interact with others as much as I can on topics that are near and dear to my heart. And black women's beauty and the standards of beauty are one of those topics. Okay, well, we're going to parking lot that for a second. It's been a while since I've had both <laughs> you on together, and there's been a myriad of things that have gone on in both your lives. So I'm going to speak with Leah first because she's living now in a different country. She moved mm -hmm. from Bolivia. Now she's in the U.S. How did that yeah. go? How's the family doing, and how's the adjustment? Oh, well, thank you. Um, the move went well. The family is fine. They're adjusting. We're getting back into our old routines and reconnecting with friends and family, which is always important. Um, I'm trying to hang in there for more weeks because I basically left the, you know, left Bolivia and went immediately into training in preparation for my next overseas assignment. And I've deferred my vacation until August. So I'm just counting down the days because I need a little bit of downtime. Um, and then I'll be taking vacation in August and coming back to the D.C. metro area to start studying Armenian, since I'm going to be going to Armenia next, and wow. I have to learn how to speak the language. So wow. these Black Lady Magic Nights are going to be dual country for a year, but then we'll go back to a tri-country situation in about a year's time. Well, I love it that you're speaking. It's going to keep on going on and on and on. So that's that makes me feel good. Uh, now, here's the, here's the real question. Why you shave off your locks? Ah, that was. What, I was wondering when that was going to happen. Mostly because I just felt like it was time. I was getting to the point where they were really heavy. I was getting tired of them, and I started feeling bored. And I knew that that was, you know, all the signs were there that it was time. I had had them for almost eight years, and wow. I felt like it was time for a change. It was like, I'm starting a new chapter, new look. Okay, no problem. But the good news is I had kept my locks and I saved them and I'm actually donating them to an asso two different associations because, as you knew, I have many, many locks. So I'm sending half to basically the equivalent of locks of love, but it's dreadlocks of love where they take, um, you know, people's dreadlocks and turn them into wigs and other types oh, of nice. devices for people who are cancer patients. Wow. So that they can continue to look like themselves. And, you know, historically, these services have not catered to people of color. Yeah. And, you know, the hair options haven't really been that diverse. And so now they've, um, you know, changed and morphed to the point where they're able to. Um, types of requests. So I'm sending my locks, half of them to, to that organization. And then the other half of my locks I'm going to send to a local organization that helps women with alopecia. 
Wow. So, you know, they're also making lock wigs, but instead of being a cancer sufferer or a cancer patient, it'll be for someone who's suffering with, you know, suffering with the affliction of alopecia and looking for alternatives while they go through treatment. So I'm sending half there and half to people who are going through cancer treatments. That is absolutely phenomenal. And like myself and Tatcha is going, I, 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 I. <laughs> so I have to be totally transparent. I do not know what alopecia is. Could you share that with me? What? I don't. Sure. I'm surprised. Okay, well. I don't know everything. My, I know, but you, you're such a brilliant man. I'm, I'm just surprised. But, oh. you, sh you know, it affects actually disproportionately African-American women. Um, and it's basically a disease where you, you start to bald. Okay. And you bald kind of not in the typical way like a man balding where you lose kind of this part and it pushes back or you lose the little circle in the middle the of crown. your head and then it just starts to fall out. It can be very spotty. So it's a thinning of your hair and eventually it's, it, it's you losing your hair. It just falls out. And it doesn't just um, affect your hair on your head. It also can be eyebrows. It can be other body hair. And wow. it's a, a, you know, it's a type, type of disease that I think, um, I don't think that it can be reversed, but that shows my own ignorance because I don't know. I think that you live with it and you're constantly treating it, but I think it has flare-ups. Like there's times when it's more affecting you and you lose your hair and then there's times when your hair can grow back. Um, and there are treats for it, but I don't think that you can get rid of it. I don't think it's one of the types of diseases that is eradicable. And so people are always looking for different options. Some women who, who get, tend to just let it all go and they just are proud with the bald, beautiful head. Um, and other women prefer to look like they've always known themselves, which is with hair. So they, you know, they get wigs and, you know, they get into really fancy, beautiful wraps and stuff like that. But that's my very limited knowledge of alopecia. Maybe the professor can say more, but I'm trying to Google something, you know, more medical definition right now, too. Wow. No, that sounds, that's that sounds a little right. Not that I know anything about uh, <laughs> no, alopecia. You don't. You don't. But in your vast knowledge, not in your experience. No, 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 no. I mean, even foliage wise, I do know that there are two different types of alopecia. So there's that type of alopecia that is more, I don't know if it's a genetic thing, or, uh, but I know there's a type of alopecia you're talking about. And then the traditional alopecia where black um, men wearing tight braids and weaves and things will get um, hair loss around the edges, which can become permanent if it's, oh, you damage the hair. So there are two different types of alopecia. Okay. Yes, and I just Googled, and uh, to Google, and thankfully I didn't misspeak, it is, um, it's a disease that can be treated, but it's, you can't get rid of it. So once you have it, you, you have to just have it for the rest of your lives. But Dr. Tachi is correct, there are two types. There's one that's alopecia total, which is all over your head, and then there's one that's more of a tension alopecia, as she said, which is areata, and that's where you kind of get the ball in random parts of your head. But in black women specifically, and I think really anyone with alopecia, it really starts along the edges of your head because that's the part of your hair. And any woman that it is a little, 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 little bit finer and it suffers from more more wear and tear just from daily maintenance. We're all pulling our hair back, you know, pulling it up, brushing it and combing it, and it's always this fine hair what? along the front. So in many cases, um, people who suffer from it start seeing balding along their temple line and along you know, the, the facial frame, um, and then it ends from there, or spreads further to other parts of the head. Wow. Okay, well, you know what? We Like, we just got <laughs> our, our science, history, yeah. uh, health lesson all in one shot. My goodness. Uh, Tachi, I know you've been doing a lot of stuff, too, so catch us up with yourself. Yes, yeah, nowhere no, near no, as humanitarian yes. as donating my <laughs> hair. <laughs> So now I just feel like selfish, but um, yeah, you know, of course, uh, things are going really well with Mediascope and, and the podcast, uh, TV channeling. Uh, Mediascope is now going to also be seen on the Burton Empire, which is a, uh, a publication that I actually write for this publication, and the um, editor 
approached me and asked if uh, I would be interested in having media scope on the on on me on um, the Burton Wire, and they're a publication that deals with news of the African diaspora, uh, both internationally and and domestically, all sorts of, of news, and it's actually an award winning uh, publication. So that was pretty exciting. And then I have there there's like so many things, but uh, one of the immediate things is that. There is a, someone had asked me to be the director for a talk show in Atlanta. So I will be flying up there to do wow. the pilot. Yay. So, yeah. Wow. Yeah. It is, it is exciting. So, you know, if it does, it does well and gets picked up. We'll, we'll see. So there are, there are a lot of production. It's going things. to. Yes. Yes. When it, it does well and gets exactly. picked up. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I can't keep up with you, ladies. I don't even want to share anything that's going on with me. It's it's like, ugh, whatever. I'm I'm oh, just no. <laughs> uh, well, two quick things before we get into our conversation. First things first. If does anyone know what this is? Yeah, yeah that's, that's Amazon uh, dot. Yes. Well, the Doctor Vibe Show podcast can be heard via your Amazon. Dot. Wonderful. Alexa. Ale Dr. Yeah, so you, so if you say Alexa, exactly. Alexa, listen to the Dr. Vibe show at TuneIn Radio, you will get that. That's the small thing. Wonderful. And, and then, Congratulations. as of yesterday, I'm beginning to do facilitation sessions for young black men in prison. Oh. Wow. So I had, wow. for, for so the first important. time in my life, it was a lifelong dream to start doing that. And I had my first experience. I had three back-to-back -back presentations on leadership for young African Canadian men in prison, and there are more to come. Excellent. So everyone's doing. We're all doing positive stuff. Absolutely, and you know, speaking to the um, the imprisoned thing, I'd always um, thought about at some point because I've been teaching public speaking for like seventeen years now, and one thing that I noticed with young African American males, uh, if they're not uh, if they don't come from a system that somehow supports them, they're like looking down when it comes to public speaking and, and not just trying to disappear. So I always said that I wanted to teach um, public speaking, you know, do a couple of public speaking workshops like in a prison or something. Oh, just, I, you know, yeah. Yeah. I'd encourage it, whether it's for, for the, the male or female or both. Uh, I know even though it's a different country, I know they would take what you have to offer with large, large positives. So certainly, uh, if you're into it, I, I, f I fully encourage it. It's a, it's a very satisfying thing. Absolutely. Well, let's get and to Dr. it. Tachi, uh, before we get to it, I just have one last request myself. Yeah. I forgot to mention that I just got booked for my first speaking engagement. Yeah! <laughs> Wonderful! <laughs> I'm yeah, surprised this is your first. Well, my first paid. Oh, oh okay. So okay. It, but it's going to be in October. So knowing that you are teaching public speaking, because that's a new fact for me, I'll be in touch about that too. Okay, fantastic. <laughs> okay, and then and yes. then and then I will add too. On November 18th, I'm going to be the master of ceremonies for the men's and women's conference on masculinity in Toronto. Oh, wow. wow, that's awesome. So, but I would never expect less from you, Dr. Vibe. No, exactly. Yeah, uh, yeah I, hey, I, just, I just, I follow the leaders like you, follow the leaders. <laughs> yes. <laughs> all right, well, we could talk about ourselves on that, but it ain't all about us. But we just wanted Not to it. catch you guys up on what's been going on, especially with the Black Lady Mag world. But Ms. Leah, you yes. wanted to bring up this conversation piece tonight, Black Women Settling Their setting their own standard of beauty. Put some background. Okay. Well, this topic is something, as I said earlier, that is near and dear to my heart because um, I think I've shared in previous shows that I grew up in a pretty much homogeneously white environment where I did look like the standard of beauty was around me. But some miracles still always felt comfortable in my own skin. But I've seen a lot of my fellow sisters in similar situations and even more diverse, to, you know, dynamic, really strong with their self-worth, self-value, sense of their own beauty aesthetic. Because unfortunately, for whatever reason, um, basically systemic and historic reasons, but 
we are not the standard of beauty. And so what we're aspiring to be based on pop culture and mainstream media is something that we can never look like. But I thought that maybe, you know, we're at a point in our, our world's history where I think beauty standards are clearly shifting. There's always been cultural appropriation and beauty appropriation. So that's part of this conversation, but even though they appropriate from us, they never look to us or give us the credit of being the originators of certain styles or beauty standards. But I'm seeing more and more, at least more representation of diverse models in magazines. Um, this idea kind of sparked this morning when I was reading a couple of articles about Lupita Nyong'o becoming one of the new faces of Calvin Klein. Um, and there was a feature, I believe a day or two days ago, where she was on the cover of Elle magazine or inside Elle magazine showing some of the photos from her campaign. And also for the first time in the history of the UK, there's a black Miss Universe, um, which again shows that in some places, these beauty standards are starting to change and move away from what has been the historic norm. And so I basically wanted to have this conversation because it's something that has always been plaguing us in that we are not the standard of beauty. People steal the things about us that make us unique, but they never give us the credit. And they only become popular when somebody who doesn't look like us does that, like a Kardashian where they you know, bump up their lip, bump up their ass, um, make themselves look more you know, with black features, and then all of a sudden it's cute. Um, but when it's us, they want to demonize us or make us like the hot and tired or sexualize us in ways or fetishize us. So I'm feeling like we're at a point now where we can really, we don't need to aspire to look like something that we can never put in the back. They're just trying to look like to realize that and embrace our own beauty and embrace our own way of being and see it as beautiful. And and use it as an opportunity to maybe motivate, lift black women of all ages to just recognize your own beauty and, and kind of marinate in it and, and enjoy it and show it to the world and, and be proud because you're beautiful and you're gorgeous and everybody wants to look like you. They may not admit it, admit it to themselves, but it's true. Well, that's so just a, being you. That, that, that is a huge opening commentary piece. <laughs> Tatiana... What speaking from your media background, what do you have to say from a media background in the subject historically? Because you've been involved in the media industry for a number of years. Give us an overview and delve a little deeper for us. Yeah, well, historically, when you did see us, because remember, uh, we were far and few between historically when it comes to any type of media. I'm not just talking about electronic media. We were far and few between. We were shaped in the images of what the dominant world wanted us to, to be and wanted us to look like. And so, of course, you have... Um, uh, all the archetypes that they had, like the mammy, et cetera, et cetera, the archetype for what all quote unquote black women look like, or all black women look like. And you know, it's it's interesting when you think about it because no, I, it was like no one thought about the reality of this. Okay, so you have this mammy character, quote unquote. I'm sure there are some women that look like that. But, but the majority, majority of slaves were not living it up, eating well. So does that make sense in you know in a historic uh, uh, way that so, you know we would look like that robot? No, we weren't eating well. We were barely making it. So when you have these things, there's no there's no looking at the common sense. Of, does that really make sense? Is this is this really the hottest thing to be? Quote unquote. Um, Sarah Bartman, or whatever they cho chose to call her. Uh, the, you know, the drawings and things were gross generalizations of what they thought uh, she looked like. Whereas, I'm quite sure she looked like a what a, you know some black women look like. But for them, since it was so different and diverse, so much from what they were used to seeing and from a European aesthetic, that's what they thought. And, and so, so it's, it's, the, it's, it's the same, same thing. thing. I mean, I know we're talking about black women, but it's the same thing. If you look at um, 
uh, early drawings of Jewish people, and their noses were drawn like overly, overly hooked and overly large. Uh, if you looked at an uh, early drawing of Arabs and the way they were, those are, that's what they thought. <laughs> they looked so the hatred and the um, everything else the, that, that they were thinking about caused this overgeneralization and this uh, grotesque almost uh, inflation of features. So that's what we're dealing with. You know, historically, the fact that we look, this is what we looked like to them because it was so different from what they were used to. And they oversimplified and inflated the, the size of the features, etc. Excellent. Uh, Leah, this subject has, how has it progressed, stayed the same, or regressed over your, during your journey? Um, in my journey, I feel like there's been sort of as if lows in the sense that it's always been that black women have not been the standard of Bless beauty. Bless you. Bless you. Um, mm. And it's been incumbent upon us to create our own spaces and create our own standards of beauty, which we've done. I mean, if you look back over the last several decades, you know, looking at style trends, looking at, you know, different color schemes that people use for makeup and contouring and things like that. A lot of it comes straight out of our neighborhoods and straight out of our communities. And then it somehow gets appropriated by mainstream culture. And you see it appearing on on white women and people who are more considered what the standard of beauty is. But you never know the origins of it. Um, braiding your hair, those two French braids that, you know, thick braids that people wear that go all the way down. Black women have been wearing that hairdo for years. As soon as the Kardashians wear that hairdo, all of a sudden, that's the new hot thing. Um and that hasn't changed. I feel like that particular trend has always been there in terms of the appropriation piece. But what I do feel is happening now is that there's less of a, a black women feeling like we're lesser than because we don't look like these white women. I think that more and more women, black women, women of color in general, are accepting and embracing who they are and being like, accept me for me. This is this is how I look. This is how I choose to wear my hair, how I used to show my butt or not, you know, or if I want to be thick, or if I don't, like, there's been a, a resurgence of, I think, female empowerment and feeling like we can be beautiful no matter what we look like, if we're curvy, thick, fit, thick, whatever, everybody, the place that I feel we haven't fully broken through, though, is into the mainstream in terms of getting our credit. However, these cases of people like Lupita Nyong'o and the woman in the UK, um, are examples that are letting me know we're slowly, case by case, going through. And you'll always have your icons. But when you're an icon, it also means that you're unique. Because everybody can't be an icon. So we have the Halle Berry, the Tina, the Lina, all of the women. But they're not like white female Hollywood is. They're one-offs or two-threes. Um, and I don't feel like there's enough representation of black females as the standard of beauty or black female protagonists in films they're usually the sister friend or they're the cousin or the friend from college. And if they are the lead, it, it's usually in a film that is where they're taking action against something or they're the sidekick to the main male character or they're a mother already. So them being the standard of beauty or being the romantic love interest isn't really the role that they're given. And so I feel like that more and more needs to change because I think that, that will change the way in which people perceive black um, and in black men. I still feel like I hear things like, oh, you're pretty for a black girl. <laughs> it's too you're late. You're pretty or you're not. It doesn't matter what your race is. If you find me attractive, then I appreciate it, you know? Sorry. But I don't, um, I don't understand comments like that, especially in this day and age. And that, to me, that, that aspect, too, hasn't changed. Because I've heard that throughout, you know, my life. Okay. Add on to that, Tachi. I, there's very little to add on because she's spot on. I uh, One thing that I think we need to do is I think, and I understand why, because you live within the dominant culture and you live in the mainstream world. And, you know, people, you know, one of our needs is to have acceptance. I, I understand that. I, for one, though, am tired of, of begging people to accept who I am, how I am, 
And you, 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 both of you know me. I really don't give two dams. <laughs> <That's true. laughs> I, I really. <laughs> so you can accept me or or not. That's fine. I think um, growing up in and, and here's the thing. Two things. The there's a there's this sense that when it comes to showing our images in the media, etc., that. This is something that will not sell widely, so we're just not going to do it. When that is not necessarily the case, what people don't realize is there there is still a lot of struggle and strife, and there is still a lot of people who may have a problem with it. But I would say a good majority of people don't care. So I think that there are um, there are things being put on. The populace said, the, oh, they're not going to like it. But did you ask them? Did you actually do some market research to find out if they... No, you didn't bother. You just think they don't want to see this. So I think that that's part of it, going back to what I was saying before as well. I think that's also part of it. Um, so that's, that's one thing. Um, I think also, I don't understand why, outside of sometimes opportunities, we... We struggle so hard for acceptance by the mainstream in terms of this is me, like who I am, like I don't care if you like me, and I think we should start stop um, begging for that. And if if you're not accepted in this space, that's why you're free to have other spaces. That's not saying segregate yourself necessarily, but I'm saying don't look for acceptance and praise in spaces that don't want you there. Spaces, spaces where you're, you're not, not going, going to be affirmed because, because you'll be disappointed, disappointed every time. time. And I, I think, think that's, that's what we need to, to, um, to realize. I think that once we start, and this is, you can go to, to Facebook or any, you know, and a lot of these blogs and, and go to, and there are spaces where you can be affirmed as a black woman for your beauty, et cetera. And you don't really have to even go to that. There are some places in the mainstream where that is affirmed, but you have to adopt a, if you don't really like it, I don't really care attitude because if you're constantly begging for that acceptance, you'll it will be a problem because you may never get it. I sense from both of you that been a there was a time where this was not like I wouldn't say all black women, but many black women did not have the most positive impression of themselves. Like the and there, what do you feel has caused this turn to me that now more black women are being assertive, and I mean this in a good way about their beauty. They're showing their beauty. What has been the turn? Do you do you have any? ideas where, where the turn happened or how has it happened? Well, can I answer this? Sure. Well, first, I'll jump in afterwards. <laughs> Absolutely. And you probably will say the same, similar, or the same thing. <laughs> the natural hair movement. I think that the natural hair movement, without a doubt, is unequivocally one of the big reasons that we started to accept ourselves more. Because the one big thing with black women, it was always that our hair was unacceptable. Straighten it. Do something with it. Tame it. It is not acceptable. It's not professional. It's not beauty. Beautiful. It was always not so what's the natural hair movement, and not just the natural hair movement, but products by black people for black hair started to crop up. Then you started to get um, all of these meetups. You started to get these groups. You started to get these YouTube bloggers talking about it. You started to get uh, podcasts talking about it. You had uh, now where, you know, once mainstream saw how profitable it was, now you have mainstream hair companies and beauty co uh, product companies developing stuff our hair too, which sorry, by the way, a lot of it does not work for me. <laughs> so it's, it, mm, they just don't have it. The thing about us doing it for us is that's like me making something for Asian hair and I don't have Asian hair. It doesn't mean you can't try, but it's going to be missing something because I don't know. So, um, that, that to me is one of the major things that led to more acceptance of the natural hair movement. I will say this, though. Not surprisingly, there's even some division in the natural hair movement in terms of, you know, the, the typing and the texture. So there are, quote, four 
different main types of textures from one to four, the closer to one you are, uh, the the wavier it is. One is actually straight, then you've got two that's wavy, three that's curly, and four that's um, coily. And so in between that, you've got A, B, and C. So keep, somebody will be like, oh, I'm a 1B, or I'm a 4C, really? that type of thing. Really, yes, yes. And this, yes. this system was actually come up by... um. Oprah, what was Oprah's um, uh, hairdresser? Is it Andre, her old yeah. hairdresser? He mm -hmm. actually developed this hair type typing system. And it's, I understand the reasoning for wanting to understand, okay, this is a little more coily than this type, but it also lends to division because what you started to have is the natural hair move then being dominated by more curly types as opposed to coily types, and that caused some strife as well. So even though the natural hair movement has been the big thing in us accepting our aesthetics and how we look, there's also some division within the natural hair movement of what is the acceptable natural. Oh, wow. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay, and, and it was interesting because when you were sharing about the divisions, Leah just rolled it over and said, yes, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> I, I, I relate. Yeah. So, add on to that, Leah? Um, I would only add, because I knew Tati was going to speak what I was going to speak to, because that's what we do. I would only say that I think the seeds that were planted that resulted in this birth of the natural hair movement were the black and proud. Black pride, big Africans in the 70s, you know, with picks and the power, black power picks and, um, or fist picks. And, you know, people saying, I still know, have one, by the way. Beauty. I still have one. Yeah, yeah my, my husband has one too. It's, and, but I you're, you're not, you're like, not going to, when I see it. Yeah, but you're not going to see any with pictures with me with my afro. That's out of the question. Do keep on going. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're not touching. We now we know we have a mission. Oh, but, yes. Okay. <laughs> But I feel like, you know, Dr. Chachi is absolutely correct, but I think the seeds that were planted were planted by that generation that were fighting fights, but also fighting for equal representation, not just in the political sense, but also in terms of aesthetics. Um, because they went wearing natural hair back then. The big afros, I mean, remember Angela Davis? That big old afro, that was part of her whole, you know, her whole image, her persona. It wasn't just what she was saying, it was what she looked like while she was saying it. Yes. And so I think that that generation are the parents of the generation that is now being entrepreneurs, making their own hair product lines, making mm -hmm. their own videos, um, you know, doing contracts with black models who are modeling black products for black hair. Um, and that all kind of links together. Um, and I, I agree with her that also in addition with the the rise of social media and the fact that we're able to connect more with each other through Facebook, through other platforms, through Instagram, through YouTube, we're seeing other people making our similar hair texture and type work using products that are made for us and by us. And, you know, I knew when I was going to do my big chop, but <laughs> I was only going to buy black products and I have, and I, I will continue to only support black businesses. Cause I'm like, you know me, I'm not going to, Go and buy a mainstream product because just like Dr. Tosh said, those dollars, you want my dollars, but you're still not making a product that is for me. You just want me to be a consumer of your product, but you don't really take the time to, you know, figure out what I actually need. Um, so you might just, you might think it's going to be something that I'm interested in because you have the word cocoa butter in it or shea <laughs> butter or something like that. Exactly. But that doesn't make... A product that I think will be sufficient for my hair. So I feel it's a combination of the things that Dr. Chachi said, plus the fact that the seeds were laid back in the days of, you know, the civil rights struggle and beyond that when we were looking for equal representation across the board. That's all I would add. Yeah, that's a little add-on. That's a very, that's yeah. a very, that's a very little, little <laughs> add-on. That's, that's very good. Yeah. When, when you, when both of you speak with young women, and do you ever get a chance to, either do they talk to you about this subject, do you ever get a chance to speak with them about this subject? Is it something, because uh, the younger women of today seem to be, how can I say, they, they know who they are. Let's put it that way. Do you, Are you pleased with the way that they're setting their own standards? Yes. I mean, I spoke on Friday with a group of younger 
diplomats. I was one of like the guest speakers at this informal like happy hour event for a group called Sisters in Diplomacy that was started by a younger um, African American female who was also a diplomat who was basically trying to seek safe space for us to be one another and sort of professionally network, but also talk about these peripheral issues that no one really discusses because it's not something that you would talk about at work. But it affects work when, for instance, our military colleagues are banned from wearing socks. Wow. And only recently, recently, I think even this week, earlier this week, I saw an article saying that the Navy reversed that decision and black women can wear their hair any way they want to. Um, but, yeah, the point was that they felt like dreadlocks in particular were not a quote-unquote professional hairstyle to wear in the workplace. Wow. But, but for black people and black females... It's a very viable, good go-to hairstyle for an active military lifestyle because you can still have long, aesthetically beautiful hair, but it's an easy style. So if you're suddenly deployed or you suddenly have to be called into something, you can just go. It doesn't require a lot of, you know, primping and preening and excess time trying to perfect your look. So it's very practical for that type of lifestyle. Well, I, I you think can you can wear dreadlocks in a bun. You can wear them in a ponytail. You can do a whole bunch of things. You can do with dreads what you do with non-dreaded hair. What I need to do my homework on, because I'm not 100% clear, is if this decision, this reversal of the decision, is across all military services or just in the Navy. And the article that I saw was speaking about the Navy specifically, so I need to do a little more digging. But when I saw the article, I commented in the group that this should never have happened in the first place for them to reverse it. Because they were saying not only could they not wear dreadlocks, but they would not hire or bring anyone newly into the military if they wore that as a style. Wow. So if I, if my dream was to become a Marine or to become you know, a member of the U.S. Armed Forces, I would have had to cut my hair off before I could have even set foot in the door to get an interview because they could have just totally disregarded me or not hired me based solely on that fact, even if I qualified in every other way. Whoa. Yeah. Is 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 it talk, touchy in the media industry? Is it is it like that? Is it changing for the better? Is it selective change? What are you seeing? I think it depends because the media. When people say the media, that's true. You're actually talking about several different industries. So the media is the entertainment industry as well. So in certain industries, certain hairstyles obviously are more acceptable. Than in if you're going into a newsroom and you're going to report the news. Now, is that right? No, but that's actually the current setup. So when you look at it in terms of the media, okay, if we're talking about, for example, network news or that type of thing, I, I don't, it depends on the market too, I think. Uh, there, I remember very well in DC and the DC market. Uh, at one point, there was a, I can't remember, I think it was Channel 7. There was one um, anchor who had like a, like a miniature, not a, like a small, nobody said anything, and it was fine. But it was Washington, D.C., and at the time, it was very childish. Whereas that hairstyle may not have flown so well in Des Moines or <laughs> Kentucky. It, 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 it depends on the market and, yeah. and who you're trying to appeal to, I think. And, and, it, and it depends on the type of media you're talking about. Somebody who's going to be seen in front of the camera or, you know, someone who's writing a newspaper article or a magazine article, they're probably going to be less stri uh, strict with what your hair has to look like than somebody who works in a very visible area like television. Mm -hmm. So uh, that I don't, I think change and all of that is dependent on what media industry you're talking about. But overall, I'm not seeing, when it comes to locks, I'm not seeing like a whole yeah, lot of change. I, I hear you. Like, I, I, that, I, 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 like I'm thinking network news. You don't see one on, with locks on network, you, and even no, on, you're not like, going to. like on your networks, like even shows on your CBS, NBC, ABC, Fox, you don't, you very rarely will you see any character with locks. You yeah. don't even necessarily see characters with natural hair either. That's Most true. It's straight. It's, it could be short or it could be long, but it's straight. Yes. I'm not saying there might be a few anchors out there, maybe on local, you know, local news media that have curly hair or more Africanized hair. No, nah, I, I think but I think when you see mainstream media, it's straight. Well, here's an interesting here's an interesting point. Would you, do you think 
I think in the like non mainstream or in the local news or entertainment, you probably see that less than you would probably see on a mainstream. I think it would come to mainstream first, then it would be coming mm-hmm, mm-hmm. to a to a rural marketplace. So, and and especially the way these days media is getting swallowed up and conglomerates are taking over those the smaller stations and the smaller that that. I, I don't know if when we'll see that sort of change. You don't even see it that much on networks like BET. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're the worst. Yeah, well, this is what that. I want to get to. We're, we're the absolute worst when it comes to those things. Often we self-define what is perfect. There, okay, there are things like the military and some government agencies, for example, like Leah was saying in terms of like the military, you may not have. They reversed it, but you may not have. And then, then there are other times where we self-impose, oh, braids are not professional, and they really don't care. You just decided they weren't professional, or uh, Negro X, who's your co-worker, <laughs> decided that they weren't professional and advised you against it. So sometimes it is imposed by rules. Sometimes it's self-imposed. So either way, it's terrible. I, I want to focus on the self-imposement piece, and it's, imp- it's interesting you bring that up. Why do you feel we're still, some of us are still self-imposing? Either one of you. I think it goes back to some of the things that Dr. Tachi and I were discussing in a conversation in the past about the legacy of slavery and the legacy of having our culture stripped away from us and being forced to live in another system where we were told that everything about us was wrong. Mm. And everything, you know, including how we looked, especially how we looked, because our blackness was what made us inferior nothing else because we were visibly different and so they then we were treated differently and that that knowledge of self got lost the more you know each with each generation and the indoctrination of slavery and self-hatred was much more ingrained in us and i still think you know we had slavery in the united states for over 400 years we're only we're not even 200 years away from the the emancipation of african americans in the united states So for me to believe that in less than half the time that we had a country that was based on slavery for things to turn around, I think is just unrealistic. So I'm not saying it's all only the legacy of of slavery and the Jim Crow era and everything since then, but it is. And it's the perpetuation of those beliefs in modern day that I think continue to hold us down and we believe them because we don't know not to, because we've been told literally since day one, and our ancestors have been told, and there's been studies, this is another aside, but it's interesting, there have been studies that have shown that genetically, some abuses and experiences that our ancestors went through stay with you. Like, Mm. it's encoded in your DNA. So some of those traumas and some of those experiences, I may not be able to recall immediately, but I'm affected by them. The way in which I perceive a situation, the way in which I decide how to act in a certain situation or react to treatment, some of it harkens back to those days. And so I feel like a lot of it is that. And then a lot of it, too, is just the stereotype of, of, of black women. That was my husband. <laughs> I heard that. <laughs> <laughs> he shakes the house. But they were, um, you know, they're stereotyping of, of the black women, too. Like I said earlier about like the fetishizing of the black women, mm-hmm. um, of the black woman, the black woman's physique. And, and I agree with Tachi that, you know, the way that the whole big lips, big butt and all that stuff, that might be part of what we look like. But there are plenty of skinny black women. And during slave era, like she said, we were malnourished. We were working, you know, crazy hours. I'm sure that that caricature might have been the way some looked, but I would say the average slave woman was not looking like that. And so I think we've just never been able to, we don't have that history. So our history is of negation, of inferiority, of being told we were lesser than being treated like animals. So I think it's going to take time for those that are not on the self-love accept me as I am bandwagon to get there. And I think it's just important, like we were saying earlier, to create our own spaces. Dr. Tachi said, like, we've got our own now. We make our own products. we got our own vloggers, beauty vloggers, beauty bloggers. We have our own space. We have our hair shows. We have Essence. We have Ebony. We have all these other, you know, venues and avenues to see ourselves represented appropriately Mm -hmm. and as beautiful and as our own standard of beauty. And I think that's where we need to look. 
Absolutely. And that's where we need to seek acceptance is from our peers, from ourselves, and not worry about what the mainstream thinks is beautiful because they're still looking at us as well. They won't admit it and they'll still try to make us feel bad about it because that makes them feel better. But that's the reality. Mm -hmm. Anything you want to add on that, Dr. Tachi? No, I co-sign on that 100%. <laughs> I, I, I agree. <laughs> so so part of one of my phrases I always like to use is controlling the narrative. And in this subject, what do you feel each of you needs to be done for, especially black women, to control the narrative of their beauty? Tasha can go first. I need to think a little bit. Oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. That, that is an important, important question. I, I think there's you know, part of it is just to to do it, and I think part of it is already being done by developing and uh, owning your uh, hair and beauty products. That's part of controlling the narrative instead of allowing for uh, companies that offer beauty products to tell you what you need and to just be beholden to using whatever substandard products that won't work for your hair. We're now controlling the narrative by developing, sitting there and developing products that will actually work for our hair. And, you know, just because we're all black does not mean our hair is all the same. Or even if you have the same type as hair as someone else, it doesn't mean that will work for you. So the good thing is that there are multiples and multitudes of people out there developing things for us, which is great. So I think that's part of how we have started to control the narrative. Also, this kind of like... Uh, this self-affirmation, if you notice, whenever you see somebody with gorgeous natural hair, uh, accolades and, and comments and just how beautiful it is really start to flow from people. And I think, like um, Leah said, this is a testament to the seed that has been planted from uh, the Black Pride and Black Power movement, definitely. But it, And that seed is planted. But when you continue to do that, it's like watering that seed that has been planted. You continue to to uh, compliment and, and affirm uh, women. I think that's part of controlling the narrative too, because we control it when we control how we feel about it. So if you know, and here's the thing, we know we look good. That, that's the thing now, whereas before it was second guessing, and I'm sure there are some women who still second guess, but now we know, and we're helping each other to do things with hair, helping each other to do things with skin, and you know, it, it goes beyond that, helping each other with fixing inside. So uh -huh. I, I think that's how we're changing the narrative, assisting each other and then controlling economically what we use physically, part of it. Uh -huh. Some serious knowledge bombs there. You want to add on there, Leah? Sure. Sure. I would say I agree with everything she says wholeheartedly. And I would add that I think we need to see more and more of us in, in the mainstream in the sense that not that we're looking to the mainstream for affirmation, but when we look to the mainstream, we see reflection of, of ourselves. So we need more of the Beyonce's and the Rihanna, like the Fenty products that she's made the makeup has been revolutionary why because the entire makeup line that rihanna created is for women of color it's not where we go to a store and we're trying to find makeup and we look for nude or neutral natural skin colors and we put it on and it's a peach line on our face because there's nothing there that actually fits with our melanin with our tones but now we've got someone out there who's like i'm gonna make it for you and you can support her because she supports back we need to see more of that i want to see some of our female role models that we look to emulate, and who, especially our young girls who are looking at trying to be, wear their hair naturally, not do the wig for that movie part, wear locks, wear it out, um, and be okay with that and still look just as gorgeous they would in, if they wore it straight. I feel like if we saw more of those types of representations too, not just models, I'm talking about people on TV, people in movies, that's where we need to see it. And also I think it would also start to shift the, the C in terms of not just when we look to those mediums for inspiration and see ourselves in a variety of ways, but also it will normalize to the rest of the non-melanated in this country that black women are beautiful no matter what way we look. And this is also a very normal way for black people to look. Again, not looking for them to co-sign, but for them to also be educated by, you know, as a byproduct of our self-empowerment. Our job is not to educate them, but they can still learn. 
from us trying to be proud of ourselves and seeing ourselves in a multitude of ways. In in every way, we look good. So I I just think there's no more limits anymore. And, you know, when I speak to younger females and my daughter and, you know, others who are coming up, who are seeing more role models than I did in my very, very bubbly, homogeneously white environment, I just try to show them a variety of things. I show them what I look like with locks. I show them what I look like with short hair. I show them what I look like when my hair was straight. And I'm like, and I look good in all of those iterations. At the bottom, at the end of the day, and the bottom line is that you just need to be comfortable in your own skin and you need to own your own beauty, whatever that looks like. Whether you want to wear your hair straight, you want to wear it natural, you want to be thick, you want to be skinny. Whatever it is, just own it and let it be what you want to be because I feel like the most attractive thing that anybody can be is confident. Mm-hmm. Can I can I add something? Really Absolutely, quickly? you don't know that. Go for it. So uh, this is this is gold, Leah. That is just absolute gold. And so one thing that it, it, it this whole thing reminded me that when we look in terms of representation, you're right. Representation is critical to seeing that things are achievable and that this this is possible. It's it's key. I think one thing though is the there are too many people. The, the non-melanated variety that control the representation. And so when you look at media outlets, when you look at Hollywood, when you look at entertainment industry, the people uh, writing the narrative don't, are not melanated. And as such, they are looking at aesthetics through their very limited, narrow view and what they know. So even if it's, it, it, sometimes it may not even be, well, we don't want that. They don't know how to work with it. So I, just knowing, and I'm, I'm sure you've seen this too, that I always look at um, some of these characters, besides the ones that, you know, now it's getting better. But I look at some of these characters, and I look at some of the uh, actors and actresses, especially the actresses, and I'm like, you live in the city that is probably one of the most expensive in the United States and you couldn't find anybody to do your hair properly? Are you really trying to tell me that? So you've got a series of bad wigs, bad weaves, <laughs> terrible braids, and all the things that make natural, etc., look unattractive because you don't have people who know how to work with it. Whereas you could go to Atlanta and Bashir the hood, her hair is late. You can't even tell that it is a wig. You can't tell. So <laughs> when you have the highest, um, the highest and most visible place in the land where there's so much wealth there, yet they can't find somebody to do hair and skin and stuff properly, that's sending out a message of this is what this looks like and this is not what you want to look like. And I'm like, do they really not see how bad this looks? Yeah, so I, I, I often wonder about that too. Yes. And you know, anybody with the Bashika now, you know they can lay some hair down. So come on. Exactly. <laughs> you know, can bring her up into them damn casting rooms. Thank you. Okay, I will have um, one of our dear friends, Diane Wright. Has uh, jumped. She said. She said, "Sorry, I missed this." But she says, "We just need to embrace who we are and stop hiding our beauty." Also, looking and trying products that are for us and support in capital letters. O U R R independent businesses. She says, "I still know black women who are afraid to wear their hair because they fear of acceptance in their workplaces. They want to wear their natural kinks, but fearful. Yes, it's a shame." Exactly. It goes back to what I was saying earlier, just about, and this is why, you know, I said that representation matters and Tachi underscored it, because if we don't, we don't need to seek acceptance from the, from the mainstream, but we need the mainstream to understand that there are, they don't define what professional hair looks like for us. And so if we are afraid to show other ways that our hair can be, they will never see it that way. They will always just go with what aesthetic is most known to them, which is not our natural hair. It's straight. They need to see straight and, you know, that look is what they know. And that is, for them, how they define what professional hair looks like. So I'm not saying go get fired from your job because you decided to wear your hair natural, but I am saying push the envelope a little bit because they need to see that you look just as good. It doesn't affect your performance. It doesn't affect the way in which you execute your job. It's just a choice about how you want to look. And it looks just as good and just as professional as any other hairdo. And that's why I'm saying mainstream representation by iconic figures that everyone loves, 
you know, become, become somehow they're race blind because they're famous and rich. They need to be doing some of this. Um, because I don't, those types of things like what, what Divine Right just said, that's what breaks my heart. And that's sort of what is at the heart of my wanting to talk about this conversation is that I don't want black women specifically to feel like they have to hide who they are and who they want to be because they have to conform just to keep a job or to, you know, feel like they're not really being allowed to live to be their full, authentic and beautiful selves because somebody else is telling them that's not what we want. And we've been told that our whole lives. I'm sorry, but those days are over. Okay. And uh, Divine Right is saying, what is up, Sorors? And I see Tatia's uh, <laughs> responded back to her. So uh, it, it's the uh, Black Lady Magic love-in, as always. With Yay. Divine Right, we have to get you on. You, 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 you know, the, you know the, you're, you're hiding, but we got to get you on sooner or later. Uh, I'm going to see her on Monday, so I'll talk to her about it. All right. Um, there's... Okay, I'm going to go here because I'm, I'm on with Black Lady Magic. What would you want to say to black men when it comes to this issue? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, I have to go there because they, they need to know. Yeah, you're right. I would say this. Black women, on the whole, have been unequivocally supportive of any, everything you do, even if you're in the wrong. So, <laughs> as such, we need that same level of support. I think that if somebody, in regards to this, all right, sometimes black men are very much guilty of saying things like, I I'll never forget one of my um, friends she gets her hair pressed out, but, you know, she'll wear it curly um, periodically. And her husband said, and was basically trying to say, mm, I don't like that, but he's like, not everybody can wear that hairstyle. Oh. Basically, he is, um, Ooh. yeah, he's a southerner. So, you uh -oh. know, in Alabama, he's, uh, no, he's from North Carolina, but lives in Alabama. He's uh, south. Very, very, um, traditional church from back in the day you get your hair pressed you don't go out with a nappy head oh, so wow. he's got that th that thing about him and he's not the only one so i understand where that comes from but you don't have an excuse i'm sorry at some point you're grown you have to understand that uh this is the way hair naturally comes out of the scalp and if she's comfortable with it you need to be all good with it it doesn't really matter what you be at the end of the day. Hair for us is not just hair. Hair is identity. Mm. And I think people are not understanding how how much hair is a part of your identity. And it's political. We've heard this before. Not only is hair our identity, it's also very political. And so when you open your mouth to say something that you know nothing about, let's be true, let's be clear, um, Men basically, black men have a couple of hairstyles for save the Jerry Curl era. But you know, you basically get it cut. You may lock it up. Um, they braid it. So there are, you know, just there are fewer options, obviously, for us. So for them, rather. So what what they need to do is just be supportive. It doesn't matter what you. It may not be your aesthetic, but if she's happy with it, you need to be supportive. That's all that matters. Just before I let Leah respond, Divine Right says, Damn, if a brother can't accept who you are, including hair that needs to step, had one dude wanted me to press my hair, couldn't accept the kinks, get to stepping. Exactly. <laughs> and she says, yeah. also says, that Alabama dude can kick rocks. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Leah, what Leah, what do you want to add on? Um, I would only add that, as I said just earlier, and I agree with the thing that Tachi said, I mean, not much more that needs to be said. I would only add this, that confidence, as I said, is really the thing that makes a person beautiful. If a person is feeling good about the way they look, um, and as Tachi said, your hair is your identity. When I was in Bolivia, my locks were just as popular as I was in terms of doing outreach because it was just a curio. People were curious about it because there weren't that many people wearing that style. They wanted to know about it. How could they get their hair like that? Is that really all my hair? 
because my hair was not only locked in, it was down to my waist. So it really was its own entity. So it's all wrapped up in it. But if a black man wants to support a black woman and you see that she's loving herself and loving her hair natural, then just let it be. It's not about you. And you're going to end up having a much happier and healthier relationship with a woman who is loving herself and confident in how she looks. And you will be the beneficiary of that if you just leave it alone. It's ultimately her decision. It's her hair. So you really don't have any say in it. It's my <laughs> feeling. I mean, it's not like we're telling you not to go get a fade. I mean, uh, maybe there you, you go. Know, so, you know, we're not getting all your mix when you go to the barber. We're not part of that decision making process. So really, in my view, you are not a part of my decision making progress. I'm giving you a courtesy if I talk to you about it and solicit your opinion. But okay, I'm going to do what I want to do because it's my hair and it's my body. So and I think you should just get along with the program because, um, like I said, if I'm feeling good about the way I look, then I'm feeling more appealing. I'm feeling more sexy. I'm feeling more confident. And as I said, you as my partner will be the beneficiary of that those positive feelings. So, you know, it's win win if you can just be supportive. I don't think there's anything else that needs to be added. You ladies <laughs> just like, boom, drop the mic. <laughs> um, it's good to have Black Lady Magic back. I know that I'm yeah. better because of it. It's fantastic. And I, I know that the moment is coming closer where you two actually meet. Yes, it's get, it's yes. getting, it's, Soon. It's getting close. Wait. It's got you got to do something live with that 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 has to happen very sure. soon. Absolutely. Ladies, yes. Ed, do you have any close I know you gave some great knowledge bombs right at the end. Any closing comments you want to give on this topic at all? No? Yeah. Good. All right. Well, it's all good. So, like to say thanks for taking time and we waited patiently for Leah to come back to the continent. Thank you. So she is finally back and uh, we're, we we know her family's good even though her husband sneezed in the background. We know Yes. Yes. We hope you know he's alive. That's proof of life. Yeah. All right. <laughs> so, uh Leah, if people want to find out more about what you're up to, what can they do? Where can they go? Sure. If people want to know what's going on with Leah World Traveler and get involved, you can go to my blog which is www.liaworldtraveler.com You can find me on all social media at the same handle, LIA World Traveler, um, on Instagram and on Facebook. On Twitter, I'm Leah World Travels. And you can find me on LinkedIn as Leah Miller. Um, those are the main ways that you can find me. I'm always posting something new. I'm going to have a couple things coming out in the next few weeks, so please stay tuned. Wonderful. Dr. Tachi. So on Instagram, which is increasingly becoming one of my favorite favorite platforms, I am Dr. Underscore Tachi. On Twitter, you can find me at Tachiada, T-A-C-H-I-A-D-A. -A -A. That is also my Periscope handle. Um, and find me Wednesday. 5 p.m. on Instagram Live, uh, handle, and 6 p.m. Eastern Time on Periscope and Facebook Live and also Twitter. Uh, the Facebook Live is the Mediascope page, so just look for, search for Mediascope, and I am there. And I always forget to do this. Besides Mediascope, I also have a podcast with my good friend Kevin No Malone out in California, and it is called TV Channeling. So we do television reviews. We do movie reviews sometimes, and we do TV, film, and entertainment news, and that is weekly. We're on SoundCloud, Stitcher, iTunes, Google Play, and Spotify right now. Wow. Wow, 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 wow. A divine right is saying she cannot wait to see when you two finally meet, by the way. Yes. <laughs> She's looking forward to that. Can't wait to. Yes. I know. Uh, and, and, and they... If, if, if the stars and God is right, they're going to be spending a few days together in the near future. Yeah, but we're not, gonna, we're, we're not, we're not going <laughs> to so talk good. about that. It becomes a reality. But when it does, mm -hmm. uh, watch out. It, it, there's danger in a good way in America <laughs> when that happens. Yes. I am Dr. Vibe, host and producer of the award-winning Dr. Vibe show, the home of Epic Conversations. I'm the host of Epic Conversations. Divine Right says, yes! And... Uh, <laughs> And if you want to watch replays of my YouTube conversations, you're at the right place. If you want to listen to audio replays of my epic conversations, you can go to my website, the D R V I B E S H O W dot com, Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Stitcher Radio, Tuned In Radio, Google Play Music Store, iHeartRadio, Alexa. <laughs>
to you, you can hear you can hear us selected audio replays at goodmenproject.com and also at WGMS Radio out of Chicago. Uh, brand ambassador for the only online magazine dedicated to African Americans in food, wine, and travel. At the name of the magazine is Cuisine Noir Magazine. Website address is cuisinenoirmag.com. If you want some empowerment coaching, I'm a certified empowerment coach, present CEO of Expression Vibe Coaching and Communications. One day I'm going to do this blank, just with my eyes closed. <laughs> One day, uh, and okay. uh, I, I, I'm not there yet. No, I really, I know, I, I should, I should be doing it. Well, maybe the next time we're on together, I'll do that. I'll do it live, and you guys can test me. The Express Your Vibe Coaching Communications touch base with me, Twitter at drvibeshow. Email dr period vibeshow dot com. Da, 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 all that kind of stuff. Uh, what else? Exp uh, what else do I do? I don't even know what else I do. Oh, I do. I do run uh, getting media coverage, which is helping businesses and entrepreneurs get media promotion so they can elevate their business product or service. I also host an ongoing series called Me You and CTE with the collaboration of the Good Men Project dot com, and I think that's it. I'm speaking in Niagara Falls in September. I'm hosting Ooh. a conference. Yes, in September. Yeah, it's called at the Truth Conference. So you can go on my website, click on the image. I'm talking about, of all things, singledom. That's going to be an interesting conversation. And the men and ma women and women, women's conference on masculinity in November in Toronto. And we'll have actually a very uh, prominent uh, guest speaker, Warren Farrell who's an expert on boy culture, is going to be speaking and sharing at that event. And uh, we'll be sitting down with one and having some epic conversations. Divine Wright, you are so good, but we need to know your website address so I can go to it and then start sending you messages so I can get you on the Dr. Vibe show. Yes, she's Three. about to do a book signing of her latest book at Busboys yes. and Poets in DC. What? At Busboys yes. and Poets? Wow. Plus Boys and Poets, I think, on Saturday. So what? You guys, for her new book, Crying Tears of Teal, it's about dealing with cancer and a variety of other topics. Uh, okay, um, Divine Right. Oh, yeah, okay. Got yes. to come home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Divine Right. What What are you waiting for? Come on now. We, you know, you're, I'm you're remember, connection when we hang out. Yeah, because so you're you part of the Black Lady though. Magic family. So you can't, you just can't hide like that, just dropping these great books and not, not, showing, <laughs> not showing your face. You can't do that. Last yes, three things. The, last three things I'm going to say. Live your life as a dream. If you can dream it, you can make it. Next up, sometimes you have to get smaller to get stronger. And finally, block assumptions. I like to say, God bless, peace be well, keep the faith, and in my heritage. Actually, two <laughs> more things. We are all happy that Charday's is releasing a new album. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Cannot wait. And happy 100th birthday. Nelson Madiba. Mandela. Madiba, yep. All right. And great post, by the way, on Instagram. One last thing, Tachi. I know you love your Instagram. Instagram's getting too noisy. It's very noisy. It's, it's, it's effective in some senses, but it is noisy. It's getting it too noisy. It's just like, but hey, they copy everybody else and claim it as their own, but that's a whole other conversation. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> Good night, everybody. We will see you next week on the Black Lady Magic Conversations and Divine Right. I'm waiting to hear from you. Good night. <laughs> Good night. Good night.